so good afternoon and thank you to Google uh, for asking me, inviting me to speak on a topic I feel very passionately about, but I don't necessarily think I know the answers here. And it's this situation I wish actually, rather than a conference us talking out, and I'm sure technology in the future is going to allow us to do it, to make it much more interactive. So feel free to heckle if you disagree. Um, uh, I'm very happy with that. But first of all, I just wanted to do a straw poll. So I'm talking about programmatic uh, and brand building uh, and how we can use programmatic to drive brand. I have been on many panels where the discussion has been about algorithms versus humans or is, uh, you know, is programmatic killing creativity. So I'm going to do a straw poll of all of you. Put your hands up if you think programmatic is killing creativity. Interesting to see. Oh my word, we have an enlightened audience. <laughs> my job is done. I can just literally say, OK, I think that's quite unusual. I think, um, well done you. Uh, generally, generally speaking, I think there is this tension and challenge around um, the technology and the data um, and what we're trying to do as brand marketeers and building brands and engaging with audiences and that they're somehow they're opposing forces. But none of you think that, so I don't need to worry about that. Um, so from my perspective, um, I want to talk about reimagining creativity because I think that's what programmatic is all about. I think we have to stop force fitting old creative formats and models into this world and start thinking about how we can be creative in a much more diverse way uh, and in a way that is going to resonate with people much, much better than we've ever been able to do in the past. I work at Dentsu Aegis. This isn't a sort of uh, uh, an ad for us as a group. The reason I put it up there is because I think I have a unique perspective on this, because I run a group where I get to work with the uh, performance businesses and the media businesses, as well as the creative agencies. And so I think I hope I can bring a perspective that's balanced across uh, those two things. The first thing to say is I think the innovation is happening in the how. Uh, not in the what. What we're trying to do remains the same. We are trying to get the right messages in front of the right people at the right time to drive results for our businesses and our brands. I don't think that's changed. How we can do it is where the real disruption is happening. And I think it's creating huge opportunities for us in how we can do it better than we've ever been able to do it before. And actually, a step further to go, you know, we always talk about in advertising, um, I know 50% of my advertising works, I just don't know which 50%. I think with programmatic, you will. And what does that mean? That means we can fight for bigger budgets uh, and get the support behind advertising in the way that perhaps we haven't been able to do in the past. So proving the value of advertising, I think, is uh, there's a huge opportunity there. I really do think this. I think everyone talks about the pace of change and things that are happening. But I think, what does that mean for us? I think you have to decide which camp you're going to be in. You can either disrupt or you can be disrupted. And if you do nothing or you don't do either one of those things, you are going to be disrupted. There's no room for not doing anything. And I think there are many examples uh, across different sectors of where businesses and brands haven't done anything, and they've re been redefined literally by doing nothing. And whether you think about retail sectors or FMCG or the hotel business, or indeed uh, you know, what brands that Uber are doing now to, uh, to the sort of transport business. So I think you've got to think about where you want to be um, in, that, uh, in that environment. If the stats are to be believed, by the end of this year, 50% of uh, display advertising will be delivered programmatically. Uh, some argue it's not, it's not, that's not, not going to happen in the UK this year. It might go into next year. But I think people are feeling pretty confident that that will happen. By 2020, 50% of all advertising will be programmatic globally. I mean, they are massive numbers. And I think just by looking at that alone, we have to think about how can we use programmatic as a brand tool? 
And what I'm going to do over the next 15 minutes or so is give you uh, a structure around how I think we need to think about programmatic and six examples. And I'll try and whiz through some of those. And it's obviously a creative presentation, so I have to try and show a film or two. Um, and I'd also like to say there's some clients I know in the audience. Thank you to the clients for allowing us to talk about some of these campaigns. I think it's really hard to get hold of the great work here. I think it exists in pockets around the world. And I think those that do exist, I think sometimes you can't really access it very easily. So I would also say some of the cases I'm showing haven't all been delivered programmatically, but actually it'll show you the potential of what can be done because it's very much about how we use data technology uh, to deliver something creative that's really driving results. So to make this easy to remember, three things. Three things I just think we need to think about. The first thing, uh, and they're three Cs. I love alliteration, and I love the number three. So I tend to find whatever I do, it ends in three and a, and a letter of some sort. The three Cs are convergence, context, and collaboration. And I think convergence is the force that's driving some of this. I think context is the shift we need to make in the how we do, in, sorry, in the what we do, and collaboration is a change in how we might work to deliver it. So three Cs. The first one, convergence. What do we mean by convergence? For me, simply, convergence is where the point of engagement and the point of transaction are coming ever closer together, and the gap is almost disappearing. And where that's happening is in the media landscape. And so as marketeers, I think we can still silo ourselves and think in this sort of very siloed way. That's, some, that's a bit of engagement communication. That's my brand communications. And then over here, I have my sales drivers and my sales activity. And we still tend to think of them separately. And I think we have to stop thinking of that way. That's never been how people who we're trying to talk to, we're trying to reach, we're trying to engage, that's never been how they think about it. And I think we have to stop doing that. And now we don't need to do that uh, anymore. And for me, all the activity we do should be about driving brand and driving, tr and driving transaction. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. And I'm going to show you some work uh, that demonstrates uh, some of that now. So the first example is uh, something that I prospected uh, for Hilton Hotels. And this is about how we... Um, took a sort of a, 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 an environment um, where we thought there was an opportunity, and that was around stranded passengers at airports where flights had been ca have been cancelled and they need to find somewhere to stay. We thought that's a really interesting opportunity for this brand. And we can think about uh, how we approach search in a different way by understanding um, where those people are and how we can reach them. So we looked at some third-party data sources, we looked at information from airports, and we looked at the airports who were cancelling flights, the top 30 airports around the world who were more likely to be cancelling flights, and we built uh, a program um, around that. And uh, I have got a video that will probably explain this uh, better than I will, um, and we'll come and talk about it a little bit at the end. I haven't slept in weeks, but these tired feet can't rest tonight. Traveling by the moon, I'm gonna get there soon, not gonna close my eyes. As hard as it is to say, when your mind is away, I still need.
So I think this is where we sort of see, and that wasn't actually a film that we, we, sh we, we used as part of the communications just to try and sort of explain uh, the campaign. Um, but it's just this sense of brand and uh, sales coming ever closer together. Another example of that, uh, I'm going to talk about British Airways a little bit later on, but this is about some of the work, and I think we have Stuart somewhere maybe in the audience. Uh, this is the work we've been doing on route marketing. And actually, uh, I think in earlier uh, presentations, talking about understanding intent. Uh, and a lot of work has been done working with British Airways to understand how we can adapt the messages by looking at some of the signals in online behavior and then trying to get a sense of what routes are these people actually looking for by looking at their behaviors and getting the right messages to those people with the right routes at the right time. And this is something I think we've all been dreaming of for years and now that we can do it. And um, the results coming back from that campaign have been phenomenal. And actually what's interesting about it from a brand perspective is we're looking at people who've never visited the British Airways website. So we can look at lots of data sources without having to go into that. And so this is about new customers coming into the brand. Uh, and you know, 50% of the people who uh, looked uh, or were exposed to the ads when they went to buy went straight through to the British Airways website and bought the flight that was linked into that campaign. It was literally feeding straight into it, which was hugely impressive. Now, I think this, you know, I'm not claiming that this is beautiful creative work, but I think it's creative in terms of understanding the opportunity. And I think the work will follow once we sort of see more of these sorts of campaigns coming through. So, the whole notion of route marketing with British Airways, I think, there was, uh, was a good one. If there's one thing to take away, and I'm sure you've heard people talk about this, but I think there's one thing of the, of the three C's to talk away, take away, it's this C, and it's context. I remember a few weeks ago doing a panel debate, um, again, algorithms versus humans, because they're different and, it, and it's opposing. And, uh, and the point was made uh, in that panel, lots of people were trying to say, yeah, but programmatic, you know, just ignores context. And it's like, really? Do you think you think, you know, we have never been able to understand context like we do now through programmatic. And again, it's about the data and the technology driving, creating signals that we can then read and interpret human behavior. So I would argue we can do context like we've never been able to do it before. And just a couple of examples of that uh, with some clients. So um, we've done a lot of work for Kellogg's. And um, one of the things that we were looking to do, and again, this is about digital and data, allowing us to do some master brand activity for Kellogg's, where we built the campaign bottom up. So we had 13 brands across 32 countries, and we had uh, some activity on uh, 200 uh, million boxes for Kellogg's. And the whole, con the whole idea behind it was around sort of building the experience around breakfast again, breakfast together, and a really lovely, very neat sort of uh, personalized spoon that you can get uh, through all these different packs and you get a little character on it if you want to uh, apply. All of that happened through one platform, so it made managing uh, the delivery of that much, much easier. But what it also enabled us to do is start looking at some signals around that. One interesting fact, so originally as part of that campaign, the spoons, we just said, right, do you want a big spoon or a small spoon? Uh, and we sort of ordered two million spoons, so this was gonna be an expensive thing to get wrong. Uh, two million spoons and um, what we saw early on in the campaign is everyone's going for the big spoon. It's like, a big spoon? Yeah, I want the big spoon. And we're sort of thinking, yeah, we haven't got enough big spoons to cope with this demand, because actually the small spoons were children's spoons. And actually just sitting down, applying common sense, understanding human behavior, you say, change the name. Change the name from, ad from big and small to adult and children. Bingo fundamentally changed it, got the, 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 the sort of the data, the, the, the orders going in the right way, and we didn't end up with a warehouse full of small spoons that we could never get rid of uh, unless we had to do barter. So I think that was an interesting one in terms of understanding uh, context. Um, another client of ours, Adidas, again, I think you might be here, not going to dwell on it, I think doing some brilliant things around understanding context around communities rather than audiences, and also um, building around events like the World Cup 
to have newsrooms to start really getting data supplied through so we can be more timely, more relevant, more real time, all that sort of stuff. The interesting thing for me about Adidas is when they did that, so when they built the newsroom, war room type concept for the World Cup uh, and how they managed that, they spent a year collecting the content for that. I think that's deeply impressive. As a marketeer, I remembered years ago, maybe spending a year creating and crafting an ad. And that's what you do, and the whole process would take you know, a very long time. So I think making the effort to do that and to get very, very organized so they had all the assets they needed as part of that was really, really impressive. Finally, collaboration. Something, again, I feel very passionately about. I believe in specialisms. I think the world is too complicated to revert back to a sort of full-service proposition where we become the sort of just jack-of-all-trades. Uh, and I think, actually, taking the specialisms that we can all do brilliantly and bringing them together, sometimes that's hard, there's tension, we disagree, we fall out. That's what creates the magic and the alchemy and the creativity and the innovation. So I do think collaboration is a huge part of our future. And I think we have to, we have to work out how we're going to work together in a better way to unlock some of these opportunities, to be much more open to working together, and to just have a bit more freedom around how ideas cross uh, amongst us. I've got a couple of examples uh, around collaboration. Uh, I'm sure some of you will have seen the British Airways uh, Look Up campaign. Um, we didn't do any of this. This was Ogilvy One uh, driving this. I think this is a, a beautiful campaign just around the idea of, you know, the magic of looking up and wondering what the plane is that's sort of flying above your head. And I think for me, the reason it's interesting is thinking programmatically, i.e. using data and technology in a more traditional medium, so looking at out of home. Um, and I think that's why it's really interesting. Lots of work went on here with uh, working across many agencies and also the media owners uh, to uh, enable this to happen. This is just a quick video on that campaign. What the public saw as magic was actually a carefully orchestrated feat of technology. We mounted an ADSB antenna on the roof of a nearby building to read live data directly from each aircraft's transponder within 200 kilometers. All aircraft emit radio waves containing their speed, altitude, GPS location and a call sign. Our antenna was connected to a PC with a custom-built application which identified the British Airways planes and sent the data to our cloud server that controlled the billboards. We created a virtual trigger zone in the sky that acted like a tripwire, so that when a BA plane entered our trigger zone, within 0.2 seconds we'd cross-reference the registration number with flight data from Heathrow to determine the destination. Cloud altitude data told us if the plane could be seen, and if it could, the information was sent to our billboard, interrupting the current content and playing our ad. to do and, and talk about uh, the sort of the, 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 the diversity of routes and the magic of flying in one campaign is brilliant. And I think for me shows the magic that, uh, that is possible. The final campaign um, is something that's interesting again because it's sort of using old data and trying to sort of reimagine what that might look like now in quite an interesting way. So this is something that, uh, that Dentsu did in Tokyo and it was for Honda. And it looks at the data that came out of the 1989 Formula One Grand Prix, where Ayrton Senna did this amazing lap uh, in the qualifiers, but actually ended up being disqualified. So I don't think he, 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 he wasn't able to win the race. But, um, but his, his, his lap, this qualifying lap, is, is, you know, is of legend. It's sort of talked about. 
What we were able to do is get hold of the data uh, from that lap and feed it into replicate what that race might feel like now, uh, using light, using sound, in quite a magical way. So I just think it's a, right, a really nice one to, uh, to, to finish on. So let's just show you a bit of that. And that's it. I hope uh, in a short space of time we've shown just a glimpse of some of the potential for brand building using programmatic. Not all these campaigns are programmatic, but they do have technology, data at their heart. And I think that shows us what's possible. And I hope in a year's time, all of you will be driving some brilliant creative work that we can stand up and showcase here. Thank you.